Let's get started with the second leg of the session, please. Our next speaker is Anders Hansen from Cambridge University. He's a mathematician. Ah, there we are. So I'll be talking about instabilities in deep learning. And I would like to ask the question, does AI as we know it come at a cost? And I'm going to be starting uh, uh, and talking about instabilities in deep learning for classification. And to illustrate the problem, I would like to show you a, uh, an article from the BBC that was published last December. And the fact that we see this now in the press suggests that the concern about these instabilities have become completely mainstream. And the concern is as follows. Take any successful neural net that can do image classification. So we can recognize, for example, a cat. You can take a tiny little perturbation that is so small that you cannot see that with a human eye. And then suddenly the neural net is going to say that this is, say, a fire truck or a whale or something completely nonsensical. This phenomenon of these instabilities happen not just in image classification, it happens in voice recognition, it happens in automatic uh, diagnosis in medicine, etc. And this is, of course, of concern. There is now a whole myriad of different ways to establish these kinds of instabilities. Uh, so I'm just going to show you an example uh, of a software that I like, which is called DeepPool. It's uh, invented by some fine researchers at EPFL. And what this really is, is an instability test to see how stable, or rather unstable, is the neural network. So suppose now that you have a successful neural network that can capture a cat, for example. You try to find a tiny perturbation so that you add that perturbation to your image, and then suddenly you get a fire truck instead, or a whale, or something completely nonsensical. And this is typical, referred to in the literature as finding an adversarial attack. So I'm going to show you a very simple example of this. What you see here now is the actual perturbed images. So the neural net is typically going to do very well on the unperturbed one. And what you see here is very hard for the human eye to see that this is a perturbed image. And suddenly the Christmas sock becomes an Indian elephant. And the dog becomes an Indian elephant. In general, you get complete nonsense. So what I would like to do is to give you a little bit of a mathematical understanding to what is going on in this pheno phenomenon here. So just a little notation. N, N here stands for neural network. N is here going to simply going to be the vector of dimensions of the affine mappings. We have a neural net, as we all know it, is simply just a collection of these affine maps. And there is a nonlinearity in between that splits them. And here is a theorem. And before I state the theorem, I would like to ask the question, should we expect instabilities in deep learning? And what this theorem says is as follows. There are uncountably many classification problems, a la Easter egg cat in the image, for which the following will happen. Take, oops, take any dimension. Your neural network can be as deep as you want and choose now an epsilon, which can be as small as you want. It should be less than 1 over k plus m. k is going to be in the number of elements in the training data, and m is going to be the number of elements in the test set. And what will happen now is that there are uncountably many cases of training data and classification data for which you now train your neural network, and by that I mean solving the standard optimization with your favorite cost function you will now have a 100% success rate. And m here, the size of your test case, can be as large as you want. So you will have a 100% success rate, but you will also have incredible instability in the following form. There are now uncountably many cases for which the neural net is going to fail, and they're going to be epsilon away even from your training data. And mind you, that epsilon could have been chosen to be arbitrarily small. But here comes the paradox. What this says is that we get the instability, well, we get the success as well, but the instability from the way we train. But there is another neural network out there that has the same success rate and is also stable, 
This guy here means the epsilon ball around the set. The problem is that we don't know how to get that guy. What we're doing, we're actually getting the instability from the way that we train. But there is another guy out there for which we don't know how to construct, which is both stable and accurate. So if we think about this question here, should we expect instabilities? Well, there are uncountably many cases for which we're going to see this phenomenon. <clears throat> so the paradox is, as I mentioned, <coughs> the train neural network becomes completely unstable. And this is exactly what we see in practice. Fantastic performance and in incredible instabilities as well. But the problem is that there is a good guy, but we don't know how to construct that. And if Alan Turing was alive today, he would have asked, is there a recursive way of constructing the good guy? And this is a fundamental problem in foundations of computer science or computational mathematics. And this might be as foundational as Turing's halting problem. And this is what we need to solve. I'm going to continue talking about instabilities uh, in deep learning for inverse problems as well. You can think about designing an instability test for these problems, just as for the classification problem. There's a slight difference here now, and that means that our problem now is not a classification, but an inverse problem. Think about MRI. So I have an image that's now sampled by my A scan here, say the MRI scanner. But typically what we're doing is that we would like to have speed up in MRI, and one takes fewer measurements than full sampling. So you're ending up with an M by N matrix, so this is an undetermined system. And what people do is that they train neural nets to take the MRI data and reconstruct the image. There's now an avalanche of literature on this problem here. The instability test is very simple. You try to take a little perturbation and see what happens to now the quality of the image. And typically, you'll have the image plus severe artifacts, and the worst case, a false tumor. I'm not going to tell you what is exactly going on under the hood in this type of stability test. I'm simply going to show you the effects. So this is a, an MRI example. What you see here to the left is an image. And what you see to the right is the reconstruction of that image after it has been sampled by the Fourier transform. And it's been subsampled, so this is an MRI speed up MRI example where we get four times speed up, so it's 25% subsampling. And the uh, neural network is trained to take the Fourier data and reconstruct it uh, to that image. And it has very high quality. Now we're going to try a tiny little experiment. We're going to add perturbations here, and we're going to see the effect of that in the neural net reconstruction. And this is what happens. Mind you, on the left, that's the perturbation, and on the right is the effect of it. And as you can see, I can deform the image to almost being irrecognizable by taking tiny little perturbations that are so small that they're not each actually visible to the human eye. So the network is completely unstable. <clears throat> I'm going to test another neural network as well. This is a neural network that was published in Nature uh, last spring. It's called Automap. Uh, Nature also um, <coughs> published a follow-up about this specific network in Nature Methods and their research highlight. And they mentioned that now that AI tr transforms image reconstruction. And they point out that it improves speed, accuracy, and robustness of biomedical image reconstruction. So it seems reasonable that we test particular the robustness via this instability test. This is also an MRI example. What you see to the left here is the original image. I must say that the patient did not have a heart tattooed as his or her neck. This is a detail that we plugged in so that you can see how that deteriorates. Uh, this is a 60% subsampling experiment in MRI. And the network is trained to take the MRI data and reconstruct it here. It's a very good reconstruction. And now we're going to do exactly the same thing. We're going to run the instability test and add tiny little perturbations to this part here, and you will see the effect. And as you can see, it becomes completely unstable. And I do want to point out that this has nothing to do with any ill postness, if you will, of the original problem. This is only due to the fact that the neural network is completely unstable. 
If I compare now exactly the same uh, experiment with a state-of-the-art method, you see that the state-of-the-art is not affected by this instability, but the neural network is. So I would like to show you a theorem that gives us a little bit of understanding of what and how and why this is happening. So I'm simply going to tell you in layman terms what it says. You will have instabilities, and they can be as bad as you want. And by that I mean the local Lipschitz constant of your neural network can be as big as you want. You can also have false positives, meaning that a tiny little perturbation in the input is now potentially going to give you a detail like a tumor that shouldn't be in the image. You can have false negatives, meaning that you have something for which you take a tiny little perturbation and, something, and, and then you add uh, a perturbation and then suddenly you're removing an important part. And the reason why this happens is simply because of these two conditions. What happens is that if you overperform on two images, this is where things go wrong. And when I say overperform, I mean the following. I have an eta plus an x, and that x is in the null space of A. A will be the sampling operator. And I'm able to recover that also, almost. If I can also now recover an eta plus a y, y is not in the null space, but it is close. So in other words, the norm of A of y now is small. And that is the, that the delta here is the parameter that when that is small, that causes the instability. And here is the problem. The problem is that when we train neural networks, we're actually encouraging this behavior. The optimization problem encourages this behavior. Also, if you, if you want to be competitive and you would like to beat the competition, well, if you overperform on only two images, this is going to cause the effect. So this gives us a little bit of an understanding that if we ask the question, does deep learning encourage instabilities? Absolutely. It's done simply in the training process. So I'm going to end by asking the initial question, does AI as we know it come at a cost? It seems now that we will see instabilities on a large scale in all kinds of different fields where, where deep learning is applied. But the question is, is this really necessary? And that is what we don't know. Because the question is now, can deep learning be made stable? But as I suggested, this is going to be a deep problem. And this is not going to be solved overnight. So in the meantime, the question is, should we now test our deep learning systems for instabilities? Should, for example, the FDA, if they're going to uh, uh, validate deep learning methods for uh, uh, use in medical research, for example, should they be tested for instabilities? I'm going to end with a question here. Could a deep learning theory change practice? This is going to be discussed a little later on. I would like to point out that the theory now suggests that if we continue doing exactly what we're doing and training the neural nets as we do, it is likely that we will see these instabilities on a large scale. The only cure for these kinds of instability disease would be to do something quite different. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention.